Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester. I want to welcome you to our June 2023 webinar. And we are joined tonight by Dr. Susan Stout. Uh, Susan is a research forester emerita with the U.S. Forest Service, where she started in the early 1980s and then became the project leader in 1991. She oversaw research activity and researchers uh, with the Forest Service in Ohio, Vermont, New Hampshire, and plus two experimental forests. Um, she's, she's done a lot of work over her time working with Central Hardwoods, I'm sorry, with Allegheny Hardwoods, and uh, enjoys now uh, seen looking for ways that she can transfer results to potential users uh, so that they can improve both research and practice of forestry. She's worked on topics such as natural regeneration, relative density, and the interactions of deer, people, and forests. Uh, she's been active on issues related to the full inclusion of women and people of all ethnicities in forestry. And as a grandmother, she enjoys uh, spending time with her nine-year-old son, who is, sounds like he's becoming quite the naturalist. And my my first engagement and encounter with Susan was in 1996, when I just started at Cornell, and somebody suggested I go to the Silva training, which I did, and it was just, it was just a really fabulous experience to meet Susan and the, the team that she was leading, and to learn about the things that they had done. And, and those that really, I think, crystallized a lot of the path that I went in um, developing my extension and applied research program. She also was a um, uh, early adopter of uh, technology. She was uh, agreed to come to Cornell in 2001 when we were doing what were called satellite downlinks. And so we had this TV studio and cameras and everything, and we broadcast it out over, remember the satellite dishes that used to be everywhere. So uh, Susan's Govan has also given uh, webinars here, uh, and it's going to be, I've got a two for Susan this year. Today we have her talking about relative density, and then in September, she's going to be joining Sarah Wurzbacher and talking about the silviculture of degraded stands. So Susan, I appreciate it. I know that you developed this presentation uh, for this occasion. I appreciate the effort that you put into that. And I had a, I really enjoyed the noon hour session and I'm looking forward to this evening. So let me share the slides. And while you do that, I'll say that I see a lot of familiar names on the, um, attendees list. And so to those of you whom I know and whom I don't, thank you for spending part of your evening today with Peter and me. Um, and I hope that what we talk about proves of interest <clears throat> and that I convince you if you're already not a devoted relative density user that you would consider learning more about it and beginning to use it in your practice of forestry. And my approach for that, um, Peter, if you'd go to the next slide, is going to be to talk about what the underlying concepts are, um, and then also talk about really deep historical background for concepts of relative density, and then sort of start narrowing down to the forests of the Northeast and some history of how ideas of relative density have grown from that deep early historical work to things that I hope will be familiar to many of you and give a few examples of ways that people have tested the use of relative density in predicting forest growth and controlling forest growth and then some recent developments. And I think we'll have time at the end for your questions. So keep track of them so that, and feel free to put them on the chat when they come to you and Peter will be able to go back through and ask me the questions when we get to them. So um, with that in mind, um, Peter, the next slide, please. The idea of 
of relative density originates with the notion that every forest type, every mix of species, every stand of trees has some natural maximum, maximum density that, the, that they bump up against. Um, and that this density varies with the species, the species mixes and with average tree size. And I think the underlying principle that I want to talk about today is that things that it's easy for us to see and put our hands on, and it's always tempting to guide our management by basal area or number of trees per acre. But the, the risk of that is that they vary, what they mean varies so much with these factors of species, species mixes and average tree size. It's pretty easy, I think, to get your eye or your thumb in so that you can recognize whether when the basal area around you is 120 square feet. And so it's tempting to use that kind of really tangible guideline for managing partial cuts. But 120 square feet means one thing in a cherry stand whose natural maximum density often goes up to 190, 200 square feet per acre. And 120 square feet means something completely different in a sugar maple dominated stand whose maximum density might be right around that 120 square feet per acre. So if we could go to the next slide. I, I have always found it helpful and I actually got this analogy from um, my professor at graduate school who talked about the fact that um, school buses in Connecticut actually have two capacities written right near the door on the side you can't see in this picture. And let's say this bus had a capacity of 60 children or 40 adults. Um, and next slide, please. Another analogy that is similar but not exactly the same is that if you look around when you're on an elevator, there's almost always a little sticker or a poster that tells you what the capacity of the elevator is. And I think it's interesting that the school bus capacity is given in number of people and acknowledges pretty significant variation in people size. Whereas the elevator capacities that I'm familiar with are very often expressed in weight. And so when you get into a crowded elevator, you can kind of look around at the size of people and decide whether you want to get off and wait for another time because you're pushing that capacity, but it's based more on the sum of what you see around you than on a, a simple count. So next slide, if you would, Peter. So if there are 40 children on my example school bus, we know it's two thirds full and there's room to pick up a couple more kids before, actually quite a few more kids, before we get to school or before we complete capacity for the field trip or whatever it is. And next slide. If there are 40 people, 40 adults on the bus, we know it's full and there isn't room for anybody else. But next slide. How, many, how crowded is the bus if the only information that I give you is that there are 50 people on it? And you don't, you can't actually tell me whether the bus is full or how crowded it is unless you have more information about the size and age mix of the people on the bus. So next slide. If I with my 50 people example, you just really can't figure out how crowded that bus is without more information. And so next slide. I think if you think about your own experience, these examples that I give from unmanaged stands based on um, standard yield tables, are, you can see the similarity to the analogy of the bus or the elevator. In a pole timber stand that's dominated by black and white oaks, 
you might find 400 trees to the acre if the average diameter is seven inches. But if that same stand, like the one in the photograph, was dominated by black cherry, and again, the average diameter was seven inches, you would expect 600 trees per acre and about 160 square feet of basal area based on what we observe from unmanaged stands that have grown fully stocked throughout their development and from the yield tables for different forest types. So next slide, we can see that as tree size changes, so when we're getting into saw timber stands, these relationships to species still hold, they're at a different level, but the cherry dominated stand has a higher maximum density, whether it's measured in basal area or trees per acre, than the black oak stand would have, even when you're all the way up into a fully developed saw timber stand. So next slide, if you would, Peter. Here's just one more example where we look at more than two species. Often red oak and red maple fall kind of between the, the um, white and black oak and black cherry in their uh, relative, in their maximum density in unmanaged stands. So next slide. So just as with the bus, you needed more information if I told you that there were 50 people on the bus, you actually need more information if I tell you that there are 175 trees in a given acre, you need to know something about the species composition of the mix of trees in that stand. And similarly, you need to know that information when you're getting ready to make a partial cut in, a, in any forest stand but it gets really compli complicated when you have mixes of these species with different average maxima all growing together. How do you decide how crowded those stands are? And that's where relative density comes in. So next slide, please. Let's talk about how we use these ideas of where a stand is with regard to its own particular maximum density. And you'll notice that the x-axis on this slide is relative density. And you can see that whether we start from the right or the left, you, and you can think about this and it makes sense that when the density on a given acre is, is very low, start by imagining a single individual tree on an acre. Its growth is gonna be about the maximum that's possible for that, because it's got sunlight coming at it from every which direction, no competition for nutrients. It's, it's got optimal growing conditions with the possible exception of encouraging lots of epicormic branches but you're not using the capacity of that site. And so to a certain extent, <clears throat> you can envision adding trees to that acre. And that's when we'll be making our way across that low relative density. The growing capacity of the site still isn't being used, but every time you add a tree, you get more stand growth. So you see that the trees are all growing at their best in the kind of pinkish line, but stand growth every time you add a tree up to a certain point, stand growth just keeps increasing linearly. But then trees begin to crowd each other. And that's when stand growth flattens out and individual tree growth actually begins to turn down. And what you really want to do with management, and I'm talking primarily about timber management here, people who've really looked at this carefully recognize, for example, that it might be a way to create a stand where crowns were getting so much sunlight that they were producing more acorns or 
um, more cherry seeds, but but for timber, which is what we'll mostly be talking about, there's that range kind of in the middle where you've got enough trees to use the capacity, full capacity of the site, but not so many that they're beginning to crowd each other and cause self thinning, which is really mortality that you'd rather capture as more growth on fewer large trees. And so relative density is the way to do that, that, that doesn't depend on figuring out a different average maximum density for every individual tree. So let's look at the next slide for some other things that um, relative density can help us with. And it's quite fortunate that um, that same range of density, that 60 to 80, maybe down to 50, that same range of rel relative density means that trees are crowded enough that epicormic branching is much less probable. And so your individual tree quality will be better. And if you look at the next slide, you can see that the, interestingly enough, and what this slide really shows is that as your relative density goes up into that self thinning range, it doesn't necessarily affect the trees that are growing your best board foot volume because they will often be the largest trees in the stand, but you'll be losing cubic volume and basal area growth through self thinning. And honestly, even though you're growing the same board foot volume clear across that red line, if you think about it, when you're down at 60%, you're putting that board foot volume on fewer trees so again, the individual trees will be likely to be saleable for a higher value. So next slide, please. That's kind of the basic concepts that relative density is built on and, and why we care to know where we are on a crowding continuum in every stand that we work in. But let's talk about where the ways that people measure relative density began. And then you can see again, what the other things we're gonna talk about as we make our way through this hour. So next slide, please, Peter. Really the, the concepts that inform measurement of relative density are these very concepts that we've been talking about already. And as people began to observe that there were some common patterns, that self thinning was a real thing. There really seemed to be this ceiling on what kind of growth we could observe in forest stands that they didn't get denser than um, some magic number that seemed to be unique to each mix of species and sizes. Once you sort of see that that pattern is there, then you begin to wonder, how universal is the pattern of that? How can we apply management that interacts with that growth to get the benefits that we were talking about just a moment ago? And how do species mixes grow compared to pure stands? So lots of interesting questions that have interested. So forestry is only give or take 120 years old in the United States. And you'll find that people have been asking these questions almost as long as they've been practicing forestry at all. So let's go to the next slide and see what other benefits we can get from relative density. We want to be able to predict growth and yield um, based in managed stands and find those similarities that we can build our management plans around. Next slide, please. So one of the most important and, and still to this day frequently cited examples of looking for how universal is this pattern was a scientist named Reinecke who published the results of his exploration in 1933. And what he had done was go out and find stands that showed every evidence, evidence of being unmanaged, either 
no management from humans, but also not disturbed by insects or wind or fire. So we, he really thought that he was seeing stands that were at that ceiling and he wanted to understand, was there a pattern in this ceiling? So each dot on this graph is actually represents an unmanaged stand that Reinecke thought was at maximum density for its size, well, just at maximum density. And you can see that as he began to look for patterns in that data, they didn't emerge so well when he plotted number of trees per acre, just plain against average diameter. But when he took the log of the number of trees per acre, and you'll see that's a log scale on the left, and plotted the log of the number of trees that he observed against the average diameter, he got this very strong straight line. And for 11 of the 13 species that he looked at, the slope of the line was the same, this negative 1.605. And that's one of the reasons that's especially interesting is that people in other fields of plant ecology had gathered data in other plant communities and showed that, the, that any plant community that had self-thinning going on the slope of log plant number over log, log plant size. Um, in fact, these are Western species, William Schroeder. I see you writing, you assume this applies to Western species too. And these are mostly Western conifer species that Reinecke was working with in 1933. So he called this line maximum density and he suggested that a way that we could measure a stand's relative density was to calculate its average diameter. So this is, a, a, this is the tree of average basal area. And then look at the number of trees as a fraction or a percent of the, where this average maximum line is. So if the average maximum number of trees for a 10 inch stand was 800, or 900 in this particular species mix, and you had 450 trees per acre, then your stand density index would be 50%. And as I say, 11 of the 13 species had the same slope to the line. So that seems that hints at universality, but the intercept, that is where the line was on this page, varied quite a bit among the 11 species. And so you could compare the productivity of different species look, by looking at how their average maximum densities were related. That's the same kind of thing that I was talking about earlier, looking at black oak versus um, black cherry. Next slide, please, Peter. A few years after, and people have, as I say, have continued to calculate stand density index for different species. I'll talk about it a little bit more later on. But people in the East in particular began to be interested in how much variation there was that you could assign to species composition. So scientists in North Carolina named Chisman and Schumacher published a paper in 1940, 1940, so just a few years after Reinecke's, where they actually said, let's assume that our stands are fully stocked. Let's take our 100 stands. And instead of just looking at number of trees and average stand diameter, let's use least squares to calculate how much space we assign to different trees in that stand based on the actual diameter of each individual tree. And then in just a minute, we'll look at what they did um, to go beyond these single species approaches. So you see for loblolly pine, which is, this is obviously not a loblolly pine on the stand on the right, but they gave, a tree area to each tree, and that's 
more of a sloped line. And you can see how much variation there was. But then they thought, if you could click again, Peter, what if in addition to looking at the actual size of each tree, we try to find some species groups? So imagine that these trees that I have circled here and, and others, that these are overstory hardwood species. And we separate those out in our formula for the least squares analysis. And we find that they have one relationship, but the pine, in, in the case of Chisman and Schumacher, the pine trees, which again, we don't have in this picture, but if you click again, Peter, you'll see that they had three species groups. So here the pink circles are a different species. There's another one over here. I didn't circle all the trees, obviously. So that imagine just for purposes of this discussion that those are the pine trees. These are the overstory hardwoods. And then the little blue circles are trees that are somewhat in a lower crown position and they had a different relationship between diameter and the area assigned to them um, by the statistical analysis that Chisman and Schumacher used. So the nice thing about this is it can, it can be really helpful in controlling a thinning because you can actually know what the tree area of every tree in your stand is once you have this equation and plan your cut very precisely to remove the amount of tree area that you wanna remove and to look at how different structural approaches to thinning would leave different residual densities. So um, let me try to foresee a question that Peter had at noon as we're looking at this. Tree area is not, it's, it's closely related to, it feels really similar to crown area, but it really isn't because in these mixed species stands, we know that crowns are actually layered one on top of another in different structures, depending on the species mix that often the shade tolerant species will fall behind and become these understory species. And their whole crowns may be covered by trees in another layer and tree area ratio accounts for that piling up of crowns one on top of another that we expect in mixed species stands. So next slide, Peter. Once we had that kind of background work that people were all, all very interested, Reinecke's work on stand density index, the work that Chisman and Schumacher and others did in the South to begin to tease out species differences for mixed species stands. There was just this burst of effort and not new knowledge brought to the table that occurred primarily in the Eastern hardwood forest. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that next. So we'll go to the next slide. And we'll talk about some work that men named Krajicek, Brinkman and Sam Gingrich, I'm sorry, I don't remember Krajicek or Brinkman's first names, but they had this idea that what we wanna do with management, and this was, this was a timber related idea, is that we wanna manage a stand so that we sort of control trees, trees having as much growing space as they could. We wanna be sure we fill the acre and, and we call one end of the management continuum maximum density for the stand, but associate it with each tree that survives having the minimum growing space that it needs to live. We're at the other end of the range that we wanna manage in. We want each tree in the acre to have its maximum growing space. So they came up with something that they called crown competition factor. And they weren't accounting for stacking the way we talked about a moment ago. They really imagined how many trees do we need at their maximum possible <coughs> crown expansion. And they actually went out and measured 
many hundreds of trees in primarily cemeteries, but some in neighborhoods and um, where they were yard trees. And they had every reason to believe they'd never been pruned, they'd never been, um, they'd never grown in a crowded way. And they got that data. And if you'll go to the next slide, they developed a relationship between tree diameter and the crown width that they had measured in all these hundreds of trees. And you can see that in their particular case in the forest mix that they were looking at, there are really very small differences in even the intercept and, and virtually no differences in the slope of these lines relating crown width to diameter, but they could calculate the crown area for trees of every diameter in a stand or for the tree of average diameter. And that would be their lower level of um, stand management. And then they could use existing uh, yield tables to define what the maximum level of stocking for that species mix would be. So first they came up with this idea of a crown competition factor. And then if you'd go to the next slide, Peter, Sam Gingrich kept working on this. And um, he, he was, as far as I know, the first to present this very familiar, I hope still familiar, concept of a stocking chart. And to introduce the idea of the A-line or average maximum density where trees have the minimum area they need to survive and self-thinning is active. And one of the things that I've always thought was really interesting, and I haven't necessarily actually done this, but if you plot an unmanaged stand across this line, if you, if you happen to have, and if you work in a research lab, you probably, a forestry research lab, you probably have lots of records of stand growth and development. And we've all seen pictures of stand growth and development in thin stands, but if you look at the control plots in those studies, they actually kind of wiggle around this, rent, around this line. And I think that reflects the um, changes in growing conditions from year to year. If it's a moisture limited site in a wet year, then more trees will survive than they do. And then you have a follow-up dry year. And sometimes it almost overcompensates, right? Because you have too many trees that live through the wet year. And so when the dry year comes, more trees are crowded than would have been had those other trees died. So you see a variation around that A-line. But the, con and the concept is that this is what a stand would do um, left entirely to its own devices and growing it at its average maximum density. The B line is the line that was in, in Gingrich's case, this is the cemetery trees. How many trees per acre are there at the B line? And you can see it's a, a whisker below 60%. I think it was actually 58%. And as far as I know, this is the first place where the sea line was presented. And the concept of the sea line was how many trees at a given diameter have to be in a stand that, that will enable it to at least reach full site occupancy within 10 years. And that's the con, so it's an understocked stand, but it can fill the growing space using just the trees that it has there. And we'll get back to that very near the end of the talk. So um, let's go to the next slide, Peter. Ben Roach is a really important figure in Eastern forestry. And I think he's a little bit underappreciated. We have at the lab a tape of a lecture that he gave at the very first training session where he talks about his experience doing, trying to figure out the right way to do partial cutting in mixed species oak stands in central Ohio. No, actually it was in Indiana in the very, very beginning of his career. And he realized <coughs> that in order to do, to do that 
really well and makes sense, he needed a measure of stocking or relative density because 120 square feet wasn't 120 square feet wasn't 120 square feet, depending on the size and species composition of the forest. So he, he knew stocking was important. He knew stand structure was important. So that crown layering and um, he knew that species composition was important and he ended up having the discipline and success to be able to spend his career solving those problems. And he recognized that Gingrich and Krajicek and Brinkman had really provided a powerful tool. So I think Ben Roach was probably Sam Gingrich's supervisor when Gingrich did that 1967 work. And he and Ben worked together then to create this even age silviculture for upland central hardwoods which is sort of a whole rotation length approach to successfully managing, optimizing timber production, and then successfully regenerating an even aged oak stand um, in the central hardwood region. And if you haven't looked at it, it's I just learned while I was putting this talk together that it's available in Google Books and it's really worth it to go find this and read it and to think about how much they had accomplished by 1968 when they put this out. And after, shortly after Ben and Sam published this, Ben actually became a research administrator or was already a research administrator. He was an assistant director of what was then the Northeastern Forest Experiment Station. And he even went into Washington and worked in the Washington office headquarters for Forest Service research for a while. But eventually he realized he really wanted to get back out on the ground in the woods. And he had given Dave Marquis the job as the project leader at the research unit in urban Pennsylvania where they really were working on a stocking guide. And Ben demoted himself to become a scientist at Irvin. And unfortunately he died before I got there, but next slide, if you would, Peter. When he got to Irvin, he began to work on uh, the stocking guide for Allegheny hardwoods. And he realized that species composition was a really big deal in Allegheny hardwoods. It was, if you look to the right on this slide, it wasn't like the oaks where all the species had very, very similar cur curves. It was more like Chisman and Schumacher's work. And you'll notice that he actually really, even in his work in, that he published in 1977, recognized that really there were three different curves that were occurring in Allegheny hardwood forests. And there's sort of some fine print in his stocking guide, guide that um, said, if you've got red maple, you've got to fudge a little bit. But, but at that point, people were still so excited about this format of the stocking guide that we see on the left, that he emphasized instead how much cherry, ash, and poplar does a given stand have. And so his stocking guide has four different A lines and four different B lines. If you could Go to the next slide, Peter. <coughs> Roach, is, Roach is quite open about the fact that he used 60% for his B line without collecting any data. He just picked it out of the oak guide and, and brought it over as a good place to start. But he installed a wonderful carefully designed, well-replicated thinning study on the Kane Experimental Forest. And I know some of you have actually been there. Um, and shortly thereafter, Neil Lampson and Gary Miller and Clay Smith and some others installed a similar study in the cherry maple type in West Virginia. And then as we began to learn things from the study on the Kane Experimental Forest International Paper Company, which at that time, was a very large landowner in Northwestern Pennsylvania, actually funded the lab to install different replicates from that study in other age classes and species mixes 
around Northwestern Pennsylvania and Southwestern New York. And we'll get back to the results of that a little bit later, but let's go on in our history of stocking guides. So unfortunately, Ben passed away before I came to the lab, but um, I, I was working at SUNY with Ralph Nyland and um, Dave Marquis had done a, um, a sabbatical at SUNY the year before I came there and had left messages and funding for projects that the Allegheny Hardwood Forest really needed. And he, he wanted to follow up on the work that Ben had done for his stocking guide. He was troubled about that red maple line. And so with Ralph's support and with support from the lab, I really looked hard at all the available in the literature, different ways of measuring relative density, including calculating stand density index and stand density index weighted by different species groups. And that actually does work in Allegheny hardwoods, but it doesn't lend itself as well to either the stocking guide format or to the whole concept of measuring relative density and stands with a whole array of species mixed in in different size mixes and being able to assign an actual relative density factor to each individual tree. And so we tested all possible combinations of species in the tree area ratio format and came up with the groups of species on the right and three different species groups. So I never produced a stocking guide in the now familiar stocking guide format because we decided that we needed at least three different species. So as many of you know, Silva's approach to calculating relative density in Allegheny hardwood stands is to have this tree area ratio or relative density factor from really the equation that underlies these three curves and assigning a, a certain amount of relative density to each tree and adding that up to get the relative density of the stand. And then Silva also got, we developed techniques where that could also be used to then develop marking guides so that you uh, were actually able to achieve the target marking level. And you may be interested to know that one of the features of the thinning study at Kane is that Ben actually marked those stands for the thinning study with a table in front of him showing the relative density contribution of each tree. So as he and the technicians marked each individual 10th acre inside each thinning plot, they were able to get each 10th acre to exactly the target residual density by subtracting the relative density of the trees that they were marking to be cut. Um, so this was another development. And once, once, when I finished this work, I had great aspirations of coming up with a universal relative density. And so people very kindly from other research labs, not only in the Northern Research, Northeastern Research Station, but in the Southern Station as well, sent me their data. And Ralph sent me a lot of data from New York where sugar maple is more likely to be a dominant than it is in an Allegheny hardwood stand in where they had a lot more white ash than um, we had in the Allegheny hardwoods. And you'll notice, by the way, that um, in, in the species in Silva, we've actually moved white ash out of the cherry ash poplar group that Ben had into that red maple group. And that was one of the things that troubled Ralph about the application of this equation in New York. And so I did develop different equations for New York stands that Ralph has consistently used, Ralph and his students have used often since. Um, but I really struggled with tulip poplar that I 
couldn't get equations to fit the tulip poplar and the tulip pop poplar mixed oak stand data that Don Beck and, and uh, Dave Loftus sent me from North Carolina that came up at noon. Um, but in the meantime, lots of other people were also developing stocking guides for different parts of the country and different mixes of tree species. And the other thing we did in Silva, those of you who are devoted Silva users will already know this, is that we actually looked at where the oak lines fell um, from the oak guide. And most of the oaks, the curve is very similar to the sugar maple beech oak. And so that's where we assign most of the oaks in Silva. But red oak in particular um, seems to be able to pack more densely than sugar maple in American beech. And so we assign red oak to the red maple group in Silva when we do our calculations. But if you go to the next slide, Peter, um, I'm gonna just show, and I'm gonna hurry a little bit now because I've talked too much, I'm sorry. But um, a few examples of people actually using this relative density measure to assess growth responses to thinning. And so next slide, if you would. Um, oh, I also wanted to tell people that Ralph gave a webinar earlier this spring and Peter and Ralph and I are gonna work to figure out how to make it available. It's not available online right now, but he spends a lot more of his talk overlaps with some of the theory and, and um, history that I share, but um, a lot more about how to actually use it to control a thinning. And then, then if you click again, Peter will show that it's what I already said about Silva more or less. But anyway, next slide. Um, Chris Nowak, who's currently at SUNY, but he worked at the lab in Irvine in the 90s. And he actually took the data from Roach's thinning study and found that to get a really good fit on the growth relationships, and this makes sense, it's really kind of an extension of the 120 square feet is not 120 square feet. He found that although the growth, the shape of the growth curves was the same across different groups of species, he had to break the individual treatment plots into different clusters where cluster one, the, the solid line here, had the highest percent basal area and cluster four had the, or black cherry, I mean, and the dotted cluster at the bottom had the lowest percent of deep black cherry. And if you click once more, Peter will look at that 60 to 80% range. And Chris thought um, that the, the maple actually, peaks at a lower level and the cherry at a higher level. And then Gary Miller reported on the similar study in West Virginia and found that that clustering that Chris had done worked well for his data as well. And again, stands with a high percent of black cherry probably prosper at a little bit higher relative density than stands with less percent of black cherry. So that universal perfect residual density that we were all hoping for isn't quite right, but they're really quite close to each other. Um, so next slide, if you would. Bill Leak is always suspicious. He was suspicious of the very idea of there being something universal. <laughs> I guess he, he, he thinks that stocking is useful. If you look at that quote from him at the bottom, we have to continue to reevaluate our stocking concepts, but not throw them out and always get smarter about how to use them. And here are the concerns that he had from the data that he was looking at. So next slide, if you would. If you... I don't know how many of you ever use Google Scholar, but if you go to Google Scholar and click forest stocking guides, there are pages and pages and pages of examples of people developing stocking guides. So there's this pull, at least for scientists, to look for these universal patterns and to apply them to forest management. And here are just some examples of ones that were developed and most of these actually use the stocking guide format, but often build it using tree area ratio. So next slide, please, Peter. 
Um, oh, I, I kept a moment because I think it's very interesting that the ideas of relative density really have this draw to people who want to understand forests. And so after, you know, 33 years after Gingrich first published the first stocking guide, 23 years after Roach's mixed species stocking guide, Dan Arner and others in the Forest Inventory and Analysis Unit decided that to improve the quality of their reporting on growth in America's forests writ large, they needed to develop a relative density factor for every single species that appears in forest inventory and analysis plots. And so if you look at reports for forest inventory and analysis, they often report some results in relative density and it's based on equations that they develop that go across the whole entire species mix. And you can go to the publication and see those. Next slide, please, Peter. So let's talk about a few recent developments and then we'll have time for questions. So next slide, please. Um, one of the things that's intrigued me, and this is, some of this started as early as the 90s, and I'll look at that one in a minute, but some of this is really quite recent. So um, Will McWilliams and others used relative density to identify the range of stocking conditions where there should be advanced regeneration. They said from 40 to 70%. It was actually we, I was on that paper too. And then they looked at what proportion were well stocked with advanced regeneration, but they couldn't really do that with basal area because there's too much variation in species composition. And so another idea that has come up since we've started paying so much attention to carbon is that if we can identify stands that are understocked from the perspective of relative density, those are places where in planting, interplanting, increasing the stocking in those stands is a really optimum way to increase the, the effectiveness of the forest as a carbon sponge. Every acre that's understocked, that's really below that um, full site occupancy is an opportunity to add some more trees and capture some more carbon. And then very recently, Mark Ducey and his students have been looking in particular at understocked with acceptable growing stock as a way to pick out of the FIA data what proportion of a state's forests have been degraded by disturbance or mismanagement. And so next slide, if you would, Peter. Um, this is the actual publication from Mark Ducey and John Gunn, and they're using a yet different kind of universal measure of relative density that I'll talk in a minute. But they found using this idea of relative density of acceptable growing stock, that nearly 40% of the forest land in Northern New England is in an understocked condition when species desirability and tree form are considered, which is a pretty shocking and policy significant realization. So next slide, please. Um, Ducey's measure of relative density, and Chris Woodall has also done some work on this, uses specific gravity of the species to, uh, to develop that tree area-like factor. And the, the theory behind it, and I love it because it goes back to this possibility of, of there being universal truths in forest growth. If a a stand with denser wood also has stronger wood. It would support more foliage biomass per tree and all other things being equal then, it would require fewer trees and hence a lower maximum density to completely occupy a stand because they have these big crowns um, compared to what we would expect in a species with lower specific gravity. And he's done lots of tests of it in New England. I've wanted to test it in Northwestern Pennsylvania, but have it. Um, and Gary, we'll get to your question in just a minute. I'm almost done. 
go to the next slide, please, Peter. So I am very close to almost done. So you can read these summaries while we talk about some questions. So Peter, if it's okay with you, I'll start with Gary's. Um, I think there are two things going on between site index and, and relative density. One is that to a certain extent, species is a surrogate for stand density, uh, for uh, site quality. So certain species require better sites. And so if we calculate their tree areas, we'll find that um, they will they will grow more densely than tree or trees on lower quality sites. It's it's part like black cherry versus black oak. Part of that is site index, but we can capture that in tree area ratio equations. And then the other thing that's different is that. The, the tree, neither tree area ratio nor stand density index tells us how fast a stand changes in average diameter. And so the average maximum density where you do have the same species mix on sites of two different qualities, we would anticipate that the average maximum, that the average diameter would change would increase more rapidly on the better site, but not necessarily changing the ceiling for what the density at a given diameter would be. Other questions, Peter? Oh, I see. Did you see Mary's question? That's No, okay, I can't so... tell which ones are popping up. OK, so Mary wants to know if um... It was shortly after it started, it was a 708 comment. Um, it just says maximum density that supports a specific function, such as uh, mean area increment or individual tree growth. No, those are going to be, those are all going to occur at different fractions of maximum density. The maximum density is what would happen if we just left the forest to determine its own density through growth and self thinning. Okay. Um, if Mary's still on, she asked a question that I'm not sure what the context is. Uh, she just said, can you get it from the feds still? So I'm not sure <laughs> she's talking about data. I'm, I'm guessing there's a data set out there that she's referencing, but if Mary's still on, she can repost that question. Uh, and then Gary Goff, um, Gary joined me in 1996 when we came out to the Silva training. He wants to know how site index plays into this, into the development of the forest and relative density. So that's one I at least tried to answer just a second ago that it affects the rate at which any given species mix moves through stand growth and self thinning. But it's also captured using species as a surrogate for site, for site quality. Okay. Are there any other questions for Susan? So I'm just wondering why do people still produce stocking charts? I mean, they're intuitively fun. Right? I mean, you can look at it and you can see the patterns and you can just kind of visual if you after you've looked at them for a little while and somebody's explained it to you you can follow along but but it sounds like they don't really work <laughs> they don't well, really work that foresters well. Are, well they work for where they were intended to work and they're not that different from tree area ratio and foresters want something they can kind of get their hands on so the stocking charts i think are a lot more intuitive than tree area ratio. It feels a little bit like, you know, like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain waving her hands and saying, mm -hmm. trust me, it's tree area ratio and specific, <laughs> wood specific gravity. And so, you know, you want to be able to 
go out and put your hand or your arms around a tree and say, oh, this tree is taking up um, 0 0.025 cent, cent acres of growing space because it's a four inch black cherry. But nobody has all of that in their head. As I mentioned at lunchtime, people tell me that Ben could walk into a stand, turn around once and tell you what the relative density was within a percent or two. But that's, that's not a skill that many people have, even true believers like me. Um, so I, I think that's some of the resistance that it feels a little bit too much like the woman behind the curtain. Okay. So uh, Eric has a question. And Paul says that he thinks Mary was talking about the, the Roach and Gingrich book on Google Books. And I found that and I posted the link earlier. So while you're, I'll read Eric's question and then I'll find it and repost it so that people can have access to it. So Eric says, I know that we were focused on growing timber, but I'm wondering if there's an application of this concept in managing sugar maple for maple sap production. Uh, this might be confounded because of our desire to manage sugar maple in uneven age stands. So I kind of stayed away from that whole even aged, uh, uneven aged question. Most of this work has been done in um, even aged stands. But if you do my Google Scholar challenge, you'll and and you want to read about using it in uneven age stands, you'll find some resources. We have used it, Silva uses it to control um, residual density after partial cuts in single tree selection and in the matrix of group selection plots. Um, but I'm getting lost from the original question, I think. Read it to so, me again, I'm sorry. Um, so could, could the concepts of uh, relative density uh, and, oh, and to sugar bush management. Sugar bush management, right. Yeah. Um, so yes, I think so. I don't I don't know a lot about sugar bush management, but I would think it would it would make sense to me that there would be an optimum relative density for a sugar bush that and and I would expect it to be on the low-ish side, but but I really don't know. Just so you have lots of crown pulling sap up, I would think. Um, and one of the other things, this isn't really an answer to the question, but I think the potential of relative density is very underdeveloped. And I was on a field trip with some colleagues whose primary work is in um, urban forestry and we were in a park where people had been planting trees and they were trying to figure out how, how dense could they make it before people began to be frightened by the density of the trees, not being able to see far through them and that kind of thing. And so I think there's an optimal relative density for urban forest safety for example, and, and I think as we enhance our understanding of the relationship between crown size and seed production, it would be interesting to see if, there are any, if there's any universal residual density that optimizes seed production. Um, we tend, I think, to, and certain, okay, we tend, I think, to, to manage our shelterwood seed cuts with the idea of getting the optimal growth out of that last five years of the trees that we leave behind. And so in silver, we recommend 60% as the residual density for uh, thinning in an Allegheny hardwood, a shelterwood seed cut in an Allegheny hardwood stand. But certainly you can correlate light passing through to the forest floor with the relative density of the stand for as another example. So yes, we've talked primarily about timber production. Yes, that's where most of the research is, but there's a whole world out there to explore. So related to that, Mary has a question. She wants to know uh, if the US Forest Service or others are using relative density when it conducts research 
on optimal sequestration rates, tree size, species mix, and so forth. So kind of a greenhouse gas mitigation application question. So yes, I think there is that kind of research going on. Um, I, I, I'm not gonna remember correctly which paper I saw while I was working on this that really addressed that question. I think it was Chris Woodall and, and colleagues. And then my colleague, Chaley Hoover, <coughs> who works in um, New Hampshire, looked at Ben Roach's thinning study from a sequestration perspective and obviously used relative density as one of the tools of assessing where sequestration was optimal in Allegheny hardwoods. Any other questions for Susan? And these have been, sometimes the evening crowd is uh, sluggish, let's say. Tonight, you all have been wonderful. So <laughs> that's a lot of, it makes it really fun. Any other questions for Susan? And if you aren't looking at the chat, I did post uh, the link uh, in Google Books for the Roach and Gingrich publication. And also I've started a blog site where Susan had given me the bibliography for every all the studies that she mentioned. Um, I'm trying to upload it there. It keeps kicking it back, so I'm not sure what's going on, but you have the link and you can check back there and I'll, uh, if I can't get it up there, then I'll just send that out to everybody who registered for the webinar. So, well, Susan, thank you again. This was a really wonderful presentation. I enjoyed it. Um, and the questions were fun and enlightening and insightful. And so I want to thank the audience as well. Susan put this together deliberately for you all. So she gets a round of applause for that extra effort. And I will reach out to you and Ralph and make sure that we can, uh, if, if Ralph's doesn't exist in digital form somewhere, then um, I've got some, some months open later this year and we'll get Ralph to give a repeat performance of that for us. So that would be great. great. So, all right, thank you all. Have a great evening and we'll see you in July. Thank you, Susan. Thank you.